focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, we have our reporters in Changana and Jo Yunha. Guys, welcome back. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening to you guys. We've been talking about uh, the whole fiasco over the chairmanship of the Korea Communications Commission, or KCC. Uh, the DP leading, uh, motioning a number of impeachment processes and all uh, the, the chairmen that we've had in the past. Well, the National Assembly signs ICT Broadcasting Communications Committee confirmation hearing for Lee Jin Suk. Uh, she is the latest nominee for the chair of KCC. Has been extended from two days to three days. Hannah, tell us more about this. Right. Now, on Thursday, the committee decided with only opposition members present after ruling party members walked out to hold another hearing session on Friday. Now, this decision was made during the proposal for changing the confirmation hearing schedule meeting and according to Article 9 of the Confirmation Hearing Act. The period for confirmation hearing is limited to within three days. Now, holding a three-day confirmation hearing for a minister or ministerial-level nominee is considered unprecedented. And previously, Representative Do Jong-myeon of the Democratic Party argued for an additional day of hearing if the nominee did not submit sufficient documentation regarding corporate card usage during her tenure as president of Daejeon NBC. Now, following heated arguments, the ruling party members eventually walked out, and the proposal to hold another session on Friday was passed with unanimous consent from the opposition members. The acting chair and Vice Chair of the KCC, Lee Sang-in, resigned voluntarily before the vote on the opposition's impeachment proposal could take place. President Yoon accepted Lee's resignation, and Lee is expected to leave the government complex in Kwacheon after a brief farewell with his staff. Now, initially... Lee was supposed to appear as a witness in the National Assembly's confirmation hearing for Lee Jin-suk, but decided not to attend and resign due to health reasons after the DP initiated impeachment proceedings against him. Now, with Lee's resignation, the KCC faces an unprecedented situation where none of its five permanent commissioner positions are filled. Now, since Lee was a commissioner and not the chair, the president can immediately appoint a successor. Now, Cho song the KCC KCC Secretary General is considered a potential candidate, but no decision has been made yet. Now, in the meantime, the KCC will have to manage its affairs with only the Secretary General overseeing operations, awaiting the appointments of Lee Jin Suk and a new vice chair, resulting in a chaotic situation. Yeah, it certainly is chaotic right now. I mean, uh, no chairmanship going on, even with the nominee. There's the interesting thing with the um, the confirmation hearing. You're talking about the the corporate card usage. Uh, mm-hmm. There was some reports. That came out from NBC, by the way, of all the people, right? Uh, uh, which I guess they had all the documentations. Because when you usually when you use the corporate card, you have to hand in the receipt and mm. where like it was being used and stuff like that. Uh, depending on which uh, which company, depending on each company's policies, like you know, like Arirang has a uh, a policy in place where you cannot use corporate cards for any. Alcohols, right? Like when you have like you know peshiks, right? You can't, you can't order, you can't do that. Uh, so like we have a very strict policy. But then some of the things that came out under Lee Jin Suk when she was the president of Tejin NBC, very, very controversial places, uh, entertainment spots were uh, spotted, and so they're going to be questioning this, and uh, it, it's looking very, very heated right now. We talked about how the KCC now it lacks a standing commissioners or any chairmanships whatsoever, committee members. Uh, with this, the ruling PPP on. Thursday started to stage a filibuster to stop the National Assembly from passing one of the DP-led four broadcasting bills aimed at the, uh, reducing the government's clout over public broadcasters. This filibuster could have lasted for up to five days, but uh, Yoon Ha, what's the latest on this? Right, so this filibuster by the PPP started at about 5.30 p.m. yesterday, and according to the National Assembly Act, a filibuster can be stopped if at least three-fifths of all parliament members consent to putting a stop to it after 24 hours. And 24 hours passed just now, uh, and as DP's original plan to stop the filibuster, uh, it was the DP's uh, plan to stop the filibuster and then put the bill to the vote. Uh, I think the latest update, try to get the latest update before coming in, and 
uh, the latest update is that the bill was put to the vote. Uh, so uh, four broadcasting bills that the DP proposed were tabled at the plenary meeting yesterday. And uh, these bills include amendments to the Broadcasting Act, the Foundation for Broadcast Culture Act, and uh, the Korea Educational Broadcasting System. As National Assembly Speaker Won Shik earlier said he would table all the four bills pushed by the DP, the PPP was expected to stage a filibuster for each of the four bills. So what the bills proposed by the DP is trying to achieve is, like you said, to reduce the government's influence on public broadcasting stations. The first bill that was tabled yesterday was about changing the quorum requirement for decision-making of KCC. To tell our listeners a little bit more about KCC's governance, the commission is supposed to have five standing commissioners, including the chairman and the vice chairman. And of the five standing commissioners, two, including the chairman, are directly appointed by the president, and the remaining three are nominated by the National Assembly and appointed by the president. However, the three National Assembly nominated positions have remained vacant since last August due to unsuccessful candidacy with disagreements between the PPP and DP. So with the passage of the amendment, the act will now require four members to be present to meet the quorum, which is currently two, and also will require a majority vote in favor for any decision making. However, the PPP floor leader Chu kyung said that the party cannot agree on the unilateral move of the DP that had a parliamentary committee meeting and pushed through the four bills on taking control of broadcasting without any proper or or serious discussions between the ruling and opposition parties. So as there are three more broadcasting bills to be tabled at the National Assembly, PPP's filibuster will continue for each of the remaining three. Even each filibuster is likely to be stopped by the DP after 24 hours. The filibusters are expected to continue well into this weekend. So we've got a lot to uh, take a look at over the weekend, and uh, we'll update you on those uh, on our Monday's edition of the program. Uh, some interesting changes uh, coming ahead here. The government launched a comprehensive overhaul of the inheritance tax system for the first time in 25 years. Uh, just in tax rates, bases, and deductions. Hannah, let's get the details of this. Sure. Now, the top tax rate will be reduced from 50% to 40%, and the tax base will be adjusted to lower the burden across different brackets. Now, the revision of the comprehensive real estate tax is expected to be finalized without further relaxation, and this decision reflects the government's consideration of the recent volatility in the real estate market and the significant easing implemented in 2022. Now, the taxation on virtual assets originally scheduled to begin next year will be deferred by two years until 2027, and this move aims to maintain tax equity with the financial investment income tax, which is also under review for potential elimination. On the afternoon of the 25th, which is uh, yesterday, the Ministry of Economy and Finance Finance confirmed the 2024 tax amendment proposal at a meeting of the Tax Development Deliberation Committee held in Seoul. Now, the proposal includes 15 legislative changes, encompassing 12 domestic tax laws and three customs laws. Now, these changes aim to boost economic dynamism, recover the public economy, rationalize the tax system, and create a taxpayer-friendly environment. Now, inheritance tax reform is the primary focus of this this amendment intending to adjust tax rates, bases, and deductions to reflect changes in asset prices and rationalize the tax system. Now, if it is passed by the end of the year, these changes will take effect from next year, marking the first overall since 2000. Now, the proposal to repeal the heavy taxation on multiple homeowners has been excluded from this year's tax amendment. Despite initial government considerations, this revision was abruptly shelved due to concerns that it it could send incorrect signals amidst recent market movements. Now, starting next year, the taxation on virtual asset investment income will be deferred for two years, as mentioned, and this is a measure to postpone the issue, which has been deferred twice already due to the inadequacies inad in the taxation system and infrastructure. I mean, there's always a lot of uh, controversy over the taxation and the inheritance tax, right? Uh, the, the top rate is 50%, uh, but uh, <clears throat> will it make a difference if you're going to bring it down to 40, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, 
the other thing is, is that they basically tax you on every single thing when it comes to inheritances, right? And so do you have to tax them on every little thing, uh, including, for example, I remember when my grandfather passed away, there was like a, a scooter that was worth something like $300 and they still taxed him on that when it was given to uh, my, my, my uncle. And so little things like this, but the other controversy with this is that this is only helping the rich, right? Mm. It's, it's none of, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have to worry about being taxed 50% on any kind of inheritance or if there is 50%, what's 50% of zero? Zero. And so I don't have to worry about this, but they're saying, especially because of the tax revenue shortfall that we've been reporting mm. on an annual basis now, uh, the big concern now is just how much further is this going to lead to the shortfall mm. in tax revenue? But are there any other amendments or new systems to be established? Well, yes, there are. Now, in response to low birth rates, a marriage tax credit will be introduced to incentivize marriage and the integrated uh, employment tax credit system, which reduces taxes for employers who increase employment, will undergo a comprehensive reform. Now, in addition, the K-CHIPS Act, which pr uh, provides tax credits for national strategic technologies, such as semiconductors, will be extended for three years. The scope of medium-sized enterprises eligible for tax benefits will be adjusted to three times the industry standards for SMEs. Now, the individual consumption tax reduction for eco-friendly cars such as electric and hydrogen cars, originally set to expire at the end of this year, will be extended for two years until the end of 2026. However, the tax exemption limit for hybrid cars will be reduced from 1 million won per car to 700,000 won, which is a 300,000 reduction. Now, for regional opportunity development zones, a plan to fully exempt inheritance taxes for SMEs is being pursued. This is an addition to the business inheritance and succession system improvement plan announced in the Dynamic Economy Roadmap in July. The tax authorities estimate that the tax revenue will dis decrease by 4 4.35 trillion won from next year due to this tax reform. Now, inheritance and gift taxes are expected to decrease by 4.05 billion won, income taxes by 455.7 billion won, and corporate taxes by 367.8 billion won. However, value-added tax is expected to increase by 356.5 uh, billion won. Now, since most of the tax revenue reduction is due to the inheritance and gift tax, the issue of tax cuts for the wealthy is likely to be raised during the National Assembly. Assembly's tax law review process, as go. SG mentioned. There you go. And right? I mean, and, uh, this, uh, there's always going to be uh, issues in regards to But the, the marriage tax credit is quite an interesting one because they're saying, what is it, a tax uh, cut of 500,000 won per person. So if you get married, it's a two people, two person household. And so you get a tax cut about a million won. Uh, it's about, uh, what is it, like $750? Uh, and tax cuts, and it all adds up, right? It all adds up when it comes to uh, paying your taxes later on. It's been six months uh, since the government and the medical community standoff first began, and the uh, trainee doctors walked out of their walk, uh, workplaces. Today, on Friday, doctors took a day off to join a forum to discuss their future. Uh, you want to tell us more about this uh, forum? Sure. So there was a forum held today by the Penn Medical Special Committee created by the Korean Medical Association back in June to address the dispute between the medical community and the government over medical reforms. The forum was held at 2 p.m. at the KMA building, and the forum was dubbed the first National Doctors' Forum for the Future of South Korea's Medicine. While the forum's themes included what it called a contradictory medical system in South Korea, doctors were all also expected to discuss how doctors could make inroads uh, to overseas to practice uh, as doctors, as most of junior doctors are not likely to come back to their hospitals. So this pan medical committee was forced to take the helm of the medical community to address the ongoing conflict with the government, but it announced on Wednesday that it will stop its operations today as it failed to bring together junior and trainee doctors. So this forum is the last activity of this Penn Medical Committee and some other existing doctors' communities who will be handed over with the committee's roles. So it wasn't clear how many doctors would take a day off today to join the forum, but the impact was expected to be limited as the number of outpatients is usually lower on Fridays. And as we've seen in past collective day-offs by doctors,
doctors. Most of doctors still provide services for severely ill and emergency patients. According to the KMA, 100 doctors across the country w a s expected to participate in the forum, and those who couldn't come in person were were to join online. But the government, while monitoring the situation, didn't take any special measures to respond to today's event. Meanwhile, before the forum, medical professors from the Emergency Response Committee of Gangwon National University Hospital and Chungbuk National University Hospital held a protest in front of the health ministry building in Sejong, calling for the cancellation of the government's medical school quota hike. The committee, in a statement released yesterday, said that more than 30,000 residents and medical students left the hospitals and schools, and the government's patchy reform led to the collapse of regional medical services and an c o n d u s i v e training environment, demanding the health minister to cancel the medical school quota hike. However, the government continues to call for residents to come back to work and is currently reviewing legal penalties against medical professors who might boycott resident training, but the health ministry still expects that such boycotting is highly unlikely. So these uh, doctors, the medical community is blaming the government for the collapse in the medical system, and yet it's not the lack of doctors due to the walkout that's uh, led to the huge vacuum and the collapse in the medical system right now. I mean, see, that's the thing, right? They, they continue to call for uh, the uh, cancellation of the, the, the medical school uh, missions quota hike, but it's happening, right? Like, like it's set on stone now. I think we have like a concrete figure for next year And the year following that, to the 2026, <clears throat> excuse me, academic year, it's going to be 2000. Uh, it's only for, <clears throat> excuse me, again, for the, follow, uh, the following year, it's going to be 2000. And then it, the chances are they're probably going to be increasing it even more uh, moving forward here. And so I, I don't understand why they're going to have to continue to, you know, fight the fact that they could probably cancel uh, the medical school admissions quota hike when it's going to happen. I mean, it's too late to make changes right now. The, the deadline set in, st- it's, it's all past right now. Let's move on here. Uh, the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, we haven't heard of that in a long time, the KDCA, right? Uh, they announced on Friday that it has issued a nas- nationwide alert for Japanese encephalitis as of Thursday. Hannah, this is uh, quite concerning, and especially mm-hmm. because I think this is because of... Uh, Mosquitoes, mosquitoes, right? right? Now, let's get more on this. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the KDCA, (coughs) surveillance of mosquitoes that transmit Japanese encephalitis revealed that on Wednesday, the small red house mosquito, which carries the virus, accounted for 63.2% and 58.4% of the total mosquitoes collected in Gyeongnam and Jeonnam provinces, respectively, meeting the criteria for issuing an alert. Now, the small red house mosquito is a small, dark brown mosquito that breeds in rice paddies, animal farms, and puddles, and it mainly conducts blood-sucking at night and is found across South Korea. Japanese encephalitis, classified as a third-grade statutory infectious disease, usually causes mild symptoms such as fever and headache when infected with the virus. However, in rare cases, it can progress to encephalitis, leading to severe symptoms like high, high fever, seizures, neck stiffness, confusion, Fusion, convulsions, and paralysis with a 20 to 30% fatality rate. Now, even if the symptoms of encephalitis are resolved, 30 to 50% of patients may suffer from various neurological complications depending on the affected area. Approximately 20 cases of Japanese encephalitis occur annually in South Korea, with most initial cases reported in August and September and extending until November. From 2019 to 2023, a total of 91 cases of Japanese encephalitis were reported, with individuals over 50 years old comprising 87.9% of the total. Now, by region, the most cases were reported in Gyeonggi, Seoul, and k a n g w o n d o provinces. And to avoid mosquito bites that may transmit Japanese encephalitis, it is advisable to wear bright colored, loose fitting clothing and use mosquito repellents during nighttime outings. The strong perfumes and cosmetics can, uh, that can attract mosquitoes should. Should be avoided. 
The KDCA recommends that individuals born after 2011 who are eligible for the National Immunization Program receive the Japanese encephalitis vaccine according to the standard vaccination schedule. Given the increased likelihood of exposure to mosquitoes that carry Japanese encephalitis during summer outdoor activities, the KDCA emphasized the importance of taking precautions to avoid mosquito bites and ensuring that eligible individuals receive their vaccinations on schedule. I'm looking at a picture of how a red house mosquito looks like. <laughs> it looks like every other mosquito. So it's basically, really difficult to differentiate them. No, it really is. So instead of kind of going, oh my goodness, is that a red house mosquito? No, just be careful with all the cases, right? And all yeah, that, with right? all the mosquitoes. And yeah, yeah, and especially because given the the what is it the ever so humid conditions right now, I think they're like what is it breeding a lot faster mm-hmm. and so forth. And and I know a lot of people during the uh, the summer vacation time, you guys are going camping and stuff. Get those sprays, the repellents that uh, everyone's been talking about here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess let's talk about this. This is going to be a very controversial one. And uh, chances are we're going to probably talk more about this next week, maybe with the expert. Mm -hmm. But the saddle mine. Uh, At one point, I believe the saddle mine was like one of the biggest gold mines in the entire world. That's apparently what was uh, being said. Well, anyways, despite its controversies, it is expected to be listed as part of UNESCO World Heritage Site over the weekend. Uh, but uh, again, the controversy over this is the fact that this area is the very place where Koreans were forced to work uh, during the Japanese colonial times and the war times as well without any pay. Uh, the information was not included uh, in the UNESCO listing. Yunha, let's get to more on this controversial uh, uh, gold mine there. Sure. So the UNESCO World Heritage Committee will review and decide on the 28 new listing proposals in New Delhi on Saturday, and one of the proposals include the gold and silver mine complex on Japan's Sado Island. Like you said, more than a thousand Koreans were forced to work by Japan in this mine complex during wartime. But Japan has continued to push for the designation of the Sado Mine as a UNESCO World Heritage Site following its attempt last year. So after its failed attempt last year, Japan this year again submitted its proposal to designate the Sado Mine as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But earlier this month, the UNESCO WHC's advisory body, International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ICOMAS, deferred the nomination, asking Japan for a more comprehensive explanation over the history link to the Sado Mine, including the modern history, and which would include a war atrocities committed during wartime. Japan's original submission, as you said, excludes the modern history linked to the mine. And after Tokyo accepted this recommendation to revise the submission, South Korea also urged Japan to reflect entire history of the complex linked to wartime forced labor of Koreans. And according to South Korean Foreign Ministry, Japan has promised to tell the entire history of the controversial mine and has already taken measures to do so after negotiations between the two countries. So this measure refers to displaying the history of forced labor during wartime uh, at this mine. And with this Japan's promise, a South Korean foreign ministry official said that the Sado Mine is likely to be listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site this weekend unless any unexpected last-minute change happens. And Japan's Asahi Shimbun newspaper today in its article quoted a Japanese official that South Korean and Japan agreed to Japan's display of forced labor, including forced labor by Koreans, of course. But how all this display will be actually executed is still under discussion. So at least a two-thirds majority of the UNESCO's WHC's 21 member states is required for a site to be listed, while decisions are typically made by consent. Census. South Korea and Japan are both members of the rotating committee, but no voting showdown between South Korea and Japan are expected. But whether Japan will honor its promise has remained to be seen, as Tokyo did not keep its promise to reflect the history of forced labor when its Hashima Island won World Heritage status back in 2015 for illustrating Japan's rapid industrialization as the first non-Western nation. Yeah, I was just going to mention that right now. I was looking up at uh, Hashima Island or the Battleship Island, as it's called, right? And, and initially, what they said was, "Listen, listen." 
if we're allowed to be listed on the UNESCO World Heritage Site, we will put all the information, right? What they say, the entire history of this is going to be. But then what is Japan's definition of entire history? Well, UNESCO later on found out that there was not enough information on all the things that they had initially agreed upon, including the forced labors of Korean. And uh, by then it was already passed and it was too late. And so this is the big concern. Are they going to be doing the same thing that they did with the uh, Hashima Island as they're going to be doing with these saddle mines? Again, uh, we'll have to see what happens, what the results of it and what information is going to go out on these saddle mines and uh, maybe cover that uh, in one of our uh, Issue Now uh, topics next week. Tensions escalating following the signing of a treaty akin to a military alliance between North Korea and Russia. We talked about this, right? The leaders of uh, North Korea and Russia signing the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Pact. Uh, that really irking uh, the international community. Well, an international conference attended by the concerned parties uh, in the Asia-Pacific region uh, and the ASEAN countries uh, opened in Vietnam, Laos on Friday. Hannah, let's get uh, more on this ASEAN meeting. Sure. Now, South Korean Foreign Minister Cho Tae-yeol, serving as the chief representative for South Korea, will attend the Korea ASEAN, ASEAN Plus 3, East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum, and ROC Mekong Foreign Ministerial meetings over the next two days. Now, the government expects this meeting to not only discuss the development of Korea ASEAN cooperation, but also to reaffirm international national cooperation for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and to expand understanding and support for policies toward North Korea. Now, particularly at the East Asia Summit, which includes countries like Korea, the U.S., Japan, China, and Russia, and the ASEAN Regional Forum, which includes Korea, the U.S., Japan, North Korea, China, and Russia, where countries around the Korean Peninsula gather. It is anticipated that there will be intense debates on international situations and security issues, including the Korean Peninsula, the <coughs> South China Sea, and Ukraine. Now, South Korea is expected to issue a message condemning the recent escalated provocations, such as North Korea's trash-filled balloon launches and the close military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. Now, in response, North Korea and Russia, which have defended North Korea on international stages, such as the UNSC, are expected to present counter arguments. Now, the ARF is the only regional multilateral security cons consultative body that North Korea participates in and is practically the only multilateral meeting attended by both uh, two Koreas. Now, North Korea's foreign minister Choi Son hee is expected to be absent again this year, with Ambassador to Laos Lee Young Char likely attending in her place. Now, this year marks the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations with Laos, a country with pro North Korean tendencies, and the attendance of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov presents an opportunity for North Korea and Russia to showcase their solidarity. However, despite increasing external contacts with friendly countries, post-pandemic, North Korea has not fully resumed its previous level of multilateral diplomatic engagement. Well, the chairman's uh, statement issued after the meeting is considered the highlight of mm. the ARF, and the key interest is whether South Korea's stance, which includes message warnings against North mm. Korea's provocations and North Korea Russia military cooperation will be apparently reflected on the statement. Well, that's true. Now, however, given that Laos, the chair country, has pro North Korean tendencies and marks the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations with North Korea this year, there are concerns that it may be challenging to reflect South Korea's desired wording in the statement, which is typically influenced by the chair country's lead. And additionally, the structural limitations of the ARF, which includes both North North Korea and Russia pose practical difficulties. Now, Minister Cho emphasized that relevant consultations are underway and the wording is being coordinated. So I, meaning Cho, do not does not want to make any premature predictions, adding that we are diligently explaining our clear position to ASEAN countries through diplomatic channels. Now, this year marks the 35th anniversary of establishing relations between South Korea and ASEAN, and Minister Cho plans to discuss future cooperation development plans centered around the Korea ASEAN Solidarity Initiative. Minister Cho is also expected to hold separate foreign ministerial meetings with key countries such as Japan and China 
China on the sidelines of the ASEAN meeting. Well, actually, he did right before we came here inside. And attention is also focused on whether he will engage in dialogue with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, who is expected to be seated nearby at meetings such as the EAS or ARF, and whether he will encounter Ambassador Ri if he attends on behalf of North Korea. Yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath on uh, possible uh, ministerial, or actually not even a ministerial meeting mm. for North Korea because Chen Sun-Yi is not there, but any kind of meeting between South and North Korea at this time. But uh, a meeting with uh, Lavrov would be mm. quite interesting because there's still the idea of whether or not uh, North uh, Russia has crossed uh, the quote-unquote red line and that uh, South Korea is going to now... Uh, supply Ukraine with lethal weapons, right? There was some back and forth in regards to this. And so does Russia want to try to prevent that from happening and try to stir up a, a dialogue with the South Korean side? We'll see. But again, as this is happening over the weekend, uh, we'll keep, keep a close tab on this and uh, cover all the issues in our Monday's edition of the program. Let's move on here. If you need money, this might be a one way to earn some money, but it's, uh, it's pretty tough. It's $10 million, though. Uh, North Korean military intelligence operative, a, a.k.a. hacker, basically, has been uh, indicted by the U.S. Justice Department on Thursday in a conspiracy to hack into a number of American entities, this including uh, hospitals, uh, government agencies like NASA. How do you hack into NASA? That's crazy. Uh, U.S. military bases and international entities in order to steal information, install ransomware, and basically hold them for ransom and say, if you want these ransomware out and done with, Give us Bitcoin. Yunha, let's get more on this. Sure. So the U.S. Justice Department on Thursday local time announced the indictment of a North Korean hacker for allegedly breaking into U.S. hospital computer systems and installing ransomware. The indicted hacker is Lim jong hyuk one of hackers working for North Korea's military intelligence agency, Enduriel. The group allegedly used ransoms collected from healthcare providers to fund further hacking against U.S. government agencies and contractors. According to the indictment by the U.S. District Court for the District of Kansas, Lim allegedly laundered the money through a Chinese bank and then used the money to purchase computer servers and launch additional cyber attacks on defense, technology, and government entities. Lim has targeted 17 entities across 11 states across the United States, including NASA and military bases. It's been reported that Lim, with other North Korean hackers, conspired to install ransomware in the system of systems of hospitals and healthcare providers in the U.S. and demanded for ransom money. They encrypted computers to disable access to information used for medical services. The indictment also states that for more than three months, Lim and other members of Enderial accessed NASA's computer system, extracting over 17 gigabytes of unclassified data. Enderial allegedly had sent information from defense companies and military bases to North Korean military intelligence, helping North Korea's military and nuclear aspirations, and this allowed North Korea to gain more information on details of fighter aircraft, missile defense systems, satellite communications, and radar systems. The State Department announced a reward, reward up to $10 million, like you said, for information of North Korean hacker Lim jong I For the NASA to be able to get hacked, that's very, very concerning. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Lim jong putting another twist into the whole ransomware, right? To basically getting ransom for being able to get rid of the ransomware. Uh, and they, I believe it was like, they, yeah, they wanted in cryptocurrency is what it was. U.S. President Joe Biden expressing gratitude on Thursday for the sacrifices of Korean War veterans, uh, stating that their sacrifices have helped maintain the strong Korea-U.S. alliance. <clears throat> Biden issuing a proclamation on this day uh, commemorating the National Korean War Veterans Armistice Day. Uh, that is actually for uh, July 27th over mm. the weekend. Honoring the sacrifice of approximately 36,000 U.S. soldiers and 7,000 Katusa uh, soldiers who died in the war. Hannah, let's get more on this. Sure. Now, President Biden remembered <coughs> the thousands of soldiers who went missing during the Korean War, and he stated that we, the U.S., will never cease our efforts to bring all of them home. Now, he also mentioned celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Iraq-U.S. alliance with President Yoon, who visited Washington, D.C. in April last year, emphasizing that the alliance is an unbreakable bond formed through the courage and sacrifice of both our people. 
peoples. Now, he recalled veterans like the late Colonel Ralph Puckett, who received the U.S.'s highest honor, the Medal of Honor, stating that Korean War veterans are the reason our alliance remains strong and vibrant as two dynamic and innovative democratic nations today. Now, he continued that veterans understood that freedom is never guaranteed and must be fought for and defended in the battle between autocracy and democracy and between the greed of a few and the rights of the many. Now, the U.S. president issues a proclamation every year to mark the National Korean War Veterans Armistice on July 27th, which would be tomorrow. We call it Armistice Day again. North Korea calls it Victory Day right. for some reason because they think that whatever was signed that day signed off on the victory of the North Koreans. But uh, we know what the actual truth is. Uh, I don't know if you guys are excited for this right now. I, this is probably the, the least amount of excitement I've ever felt in all the years that I've ever watched these summer games. I mean, I like the winter games better anyways, but still. Uh, Paris 2024, uh, we're talking about the summer games here, is kicking off. Uh, I guess early Saturday morning Korea time. It's going to happen 7.30 local time over in uh, the French capital of Paris. But uh, maybe it's because of the low number of delegates that are going over to uh, Paris or the fact that, uh, you know, not a lot of uh, hope in uh, gold medal finishes for Team South Korea. I don't know. But still, it's a big deal. And the opening ceremony uh, for the Paris Games historic because it's not happening inside a stadium instead it's going to happen by river scene mm. and of course uh all eyes on how south korea is going to fare although they had some preliminary rounds some ranking rounds uh, for some of the uh, events already yunha I don't know if you're excited for the summer games, but still, uh, let's get more on the opening ceremony. Sure. So Paris hosts Olympics Games again in 100 years under the motto of Games Wide Open. The games will officially begin on Friday local time with the opening ceremony by the River Scene, like you said. And there will be boats carrying athletes and dignitaries from around the world down six kilometers with about 300,000 spectators present. For the first time in Summer Games history, it will be held outside the stadium, and the boats will pass Paris' most iconic landmarks like the Louvre and Notre Dame. One notable fact is that Paris Game is the first to achieve gender parity among athletes, with 5,250 male and 5,250 female athletes set to compete. So uh, now there is a huge security operation already set in place, with 5,000 police soldiers and hired guards on patrol at any time during the games. There are about 10,500 athletes representing 206 na national Olympic committees taking part in the Games, and there are 32 sports and 329 gold medals to win. So uh, for South Korea, there are 404 143 South Korean athletes joining the Olympics for 21 sports, which is the smallest group of in. Uh, group in 48 years since the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal. As South Korea competes with the uh, small squad this time, it aims to win uh, the 15th place in the overall medal table by securing five gold medals. And South Korean archers, uh, by the way, finished first in the men's individual, women's individual, team and mixed team archery ranking rounds of the Paris Olympics, raising hopes for the team's win. And the Korean women's handball team won a narrow 22 to 22, 23 to 22 win over Germany in Group A on Thursday last night, which marked a good start for the team's journey to win the only available medal in team sports for South Korea. Yeah, women's handball is the only ball sport. That's yeah, that's, a complete, that's, that's what that's I heard. Yeah, crazy. Guys, thank you very much for your reports. Have a safe one. Enjoy the opening game, opening ceremony. And that's the best part, right? I right. mean, then, uh, and then uh, we'll see you guys again next week. Thank you. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.